Hello and welcome to chapter four. We are going to start a new topic today and that topic is called integration. So to talk about integration, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at section 4.1 which is called antiderivatives and indefinite integration. While in section 4.1, we're going to look at writing the general solution of a differential equation. We're going to use indefinite integral notation for antiderivatives. We're going to use basic integration rules to find antiderivatives, and then we're going to find a particular solution for a differential equation. So let's go ahead and begin with antiderivatives. I want you to begin by asking yourself how you would go about finding a function f whose derivative is f of x equals 3x squared. So from what you already know about derivatives, you would probably say that this function f equals x cubed because if you take the derivative of x cubed you get 3x squared. The function f is what we call an antiderivative of f. And the actual definition of an antiderivative says a function f is an antiderivative of f on an interval i if f prime of x equals f of x for all x. So in other words if I take the derivative of this function and I get this or f then that tells me that th this f with a capital letter is the antiderivative. On a side note, I would like to um, kind of throw out there that the capital letter f is an antiderivative, not the antiderivative. And that's because if I give you a function um, and I say that f, and that's a capital F, of x equals x cubed plus 3, this is going to have the same antiderivative, or I'm sorry, the same derivative as x cubed because we're not going to take the derivative of the plus 3. So when we go to take our antiderivative, our antiderivative really should have been capital F of x equals x cubed plus c, and c is just going to be some arbitrary constant. Now theorem 4.1 in your book actually talks about this and it says if f is an antiderivative of the function f on an interval i then g is an antiderivative of the function f on that same interval if and only if g is of the form g of x equals f of x plus c and f of x being the antiderivative for all x where c is a constant. Now let's kind of reiterate this. C is what we call the constant of integration. Capital F of X is what we're going to call our general antiderivative of F. And the equation capital F of X equals x cubed plus c from the previous example is what we call the general solution. Now while we're on this slide, this right here I just kind of hit up on the last slide here. But I want to kind of point out that a differential equation in x and y is an equation that involves x, y, and the derivatives of y. So for example, if you look at y prime equals 3x and y prime equals x squared plus 1, these are actual examples of differential equations. So if we look at example one, it says find the general solution of the differential equation y prime equals two. So in other words, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find the function whose derivative is two. So we're gonna come up with some function y equals, and if I wanna get a derivative of two, I know that I had to have a variable x with that so that when I took the derivative, I got just a two and no x variable. So if you think about it, this is really 2x to the first. If I bring that 1 down, multiply it by 2, I get just 2, and then the x goes away. And don't forget to add your plus c for the generic form. And just so you kind of have an idea of what pattern or what role that c uh, plays, this is kind of what's going to happen. This equation right here is going to have the same slope of 2 as this one and this one. So without knowing any more information, 
we have to include the plus C, and yes, you will get points deducted if you don't. Um, so you have to include that point C because we don't know which slope, or I'm sorry, which line we're actually looking at because they all have the same slope. Now let's go ahead and look at the notation for antiderivatives. When we are solving a differential equation of the form dy dx equals f of x, it's usually easier to write the equivalent form in the differential form, which I told you this would be helpful in chapter 4, as dy equals f of x dx. So the operation of finding all solutions is going to be called the anti-differentiation or the indefinite integration and is denoted by this little s-looking symbol. So just so you can see it a little bit better, it kind of looks like this. And this means that we're going to be taking the antiderivative. So to kind of recap everything, we have the general solution is given by y equals the integral of f of x dx. This symbol here is our integral. f of x is what we call the integrand, because that's what we're taking the integral of. And this dx here tells us the variable of integration. Now, when we actually take the antiderivative, we end up with capital F of x, or the antiderivative of F of x. And this plus c is our constant of integration. You do need to know all of these pieces, because I will be giving you a quiz that just has you label all the different pieces. So please make sure you know this format. When we go to read this expression, it's read as the antiderivative of f with respect to x. So this little dx here actually goes ahead and tells us that x is a variable of integration. And the term indefinite integral is actually the same thing as an antiderivative. Let's go ahead and look at some basic rules for integration. Now, the integration and anti or I'm sorry, the integration and differentiation processes can actually be kind of viewed as a inverse type property. So if I take the integral of a derivative, I'm going to end up with the function itself. Likewise, if I take the derivative, which is what this ddx is, if I take the derivative of the integral, I'm going to again end up with the function itself. So in other words, an integral will undo a derivative, and a derivative will undo an integral. And if you look here, um, and I've got another slide here in just a second with more of these, but this side right here, these are our differentiation rules that we've actually been talking about, um, like in the last two chapters. Over here is the opposite. These are the integration rules. So if I take the, the derivative of a constant, I get 0. If I take the integral of, a, of 0, I'm going to end up with a constant. Over here, if I take the derivative of a value k, which is just some arbitrary number, and I'm going to multiply that by x, that's the same thing as taking the integral of k dx, which is going to be kx plus c. If I take the derivative of k times f, k being a scalar, then I end up with k times the derivative. k is still a, k, a scalar. Likewise, if I take the integral of k times f of x, then I'm going to take out that scalar, I'm going to integrate, and then I will be multiplying that integrand by that scalar as well. If I take the derivative of a sum or difference, I end up with the derivative of the sum or difference, so plus or minus g of x. And if I undo that with an integral, then I'm going to get the integral of f plus or minus the integral of g. And you can continue on looking at the rest of these patterns. And here's another list of our trig functions that are still basic integration rules. So if I take the derivative of sine, I know I get cosine. Oops. If I integrate cosine, I'm going to end up with sine. Likewise, if I take the derivative of cosine, I get a negative sine. And if I integrate sine, I end up with a negative cosine. And again, you can go ahead and review the rest of the rules on your own. Now, you don't necessarily have to write all of these down right now, but these are values that you are expected to know for the AP test. Therefore, I will not give you a cheat sheet on any test or quiz that we take. So, for example, two, we're going to describe the antiderivatives of 3x. So, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go and we're going to take the integral of 3x dx. 
Because 3 is actually a constant, I can rewrite that out up front. So I have 3 times the integral of x dx. Now when I integrate x, this is going to give me 3 times the integral of x is going to give me x squared because I have to raise the power. And then I also have to divide by that same power that I just raised it to. So I end up with x squared divided by 2. And then I'm going to add c. So if I simplify this, I end up with 3 halves x squared plus c as my integral. On a quick side note, um, one thing I do want to point out to you is that when we integrate, actually let me go back and rewrite this step right here. This is really 3 times the integral of x dx. And my 3 is going to remain here. And if I integrate that x, I really end up with x divided, or I'm sorry, x squared divided by 2 plus c. Therefore, I would have to distribute that 3. So that gives me 3x squared divided by 2 plus 3c. Well, because c is just some arbitrary constant, I actually do not need to include that, that value of 3. So that's why I can actually go ahead and eliminate that and end up with just uh, this 3 halves x squared plus c. So when we are um, doing basic integration, there's a general pattern of integration that's similar to differentiation. The first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to write your original integral. Then you're going to rewrite it if possible. And by rewriting it, I mean factoring out constants um, and so forth. Then we're going to actually do the actual integration. And then if we have to, we're going to simplify. And by simplifying, I mean maybe distributing that constant that we took out and so forth. So, for example, 3, and I apologize, you're going to have to deal with this uh, writing here. But I want to integrate 1 divided by x cubed dx. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite that as the integral of x to the negative third dx. And what I'm going to do now is I know that when I add 1 to a negative 3, that's really going to give me a negative 2. And then I also have to divide by that negative 2. And then I'm going to add c. So my actual answer then would be a negative 1 half x squared is going to be on the bottom because it's raised to the negative second plus c. So this here would then be my final integral. For part b, I'm going to integrate the square root of x dx. And again, I'm going to rewrite that as x to the 1 half dx. So when I integrate that, I'm going to add 1 to my exponent which is going to give me x to the 3 halves. And then I'm going to divide by 3 halves, which is really the same thing as multiplying by 2 thirds. So this then will give me 2 thirds x to the 3 halves power. I'm sorry, that should be a 2 right here. And then don't forget your plus c, because it is incorrect without that c value. And now for our favorite example, we're going to do a trig problem. We're going to take the integral of 2 sine x dx. So if I rewrite that, I'm going to factor out the 2 in front of the integral sign. And I'm really going to be integrating just sine x dx. Now for trig, I have to undo the derivative. So the integral of sine then is actually going to be a negative cosine. Because when I take the derivative of a negative cosine, it's going to give me a positive sign. So this then is going to give me 2 times a negative cosine of x plus c. And I can rewrite that as a negative 2 cosine of x plus c. And this would be my final answer then. For example 4, we are going to integrate x plus 1 divided by the square root of x. So the first thing I would do is I'm going to separate this out into two different pieces. Oops, and I did forget my dx. So this becomes the integral 
of x divided by the square root of x plus 1 divided by the square root of x, and this should all be in parentheses, dx. So now I can go ahead and integrate this. And actually, before I do that, I need to simplify. So I really have the integral of x divided by x to the 1 half is really what that is. So if I have x to the first divided by x to the 1 half, remember with our power properties, we're going to subtract our exponents. So this becomes x to the positive 1 half plus x to the negative 1 half, and that is dx. So now when I integrate, I'm going to raise the 1 half. I'm going to add, that, add 1 to 1 half. So this is going to give me x to the 3 halves. I'm going to multiply by the reciprocal because I'm going to be really dividing by 3 halves. So this is going to give me 2 thirds x to the 3 halves plus, and when I go to integrate x to the negative 1 half, I add 1 to the exponent, which gives me x to the positive 1 half. And then to when I divide by 1 half, that's really the same thing as multiplying by 2. And then I have my plus c. So this right here then is going to be the integral of this function here. And don't forget that you can always double check your work by taking the derivative of this and that should get you right back to that first original problem. Now example 5 is a trig problem and it says that we're going to integrate the sine of x divided by cosine squared x dx. So the first thing I would do is I would rewrite this. And I'm going to rewrite this so that we have the integral of 1 divided by the cosine of x. You are going to have to use some of your trig properties. And that's really being multiplied by sine x divided by cosine x dx. So by doing this, what I can really do then is I can rewrite this as 1 divided by 1, I'm sorry, the integral of 1 divided by cosine x is really secant x. And sine divided by cosine is really tan x. So now I'm able to integrate secant tangent. And I'm hoping that you remember your derivative properties. Because the derivative of secant tangent is actually equal to secant x plus c. So again, if you take the derivative of secant, you're going to end up with secant tangent. And this now will complete our part one of section 4.1. On that note, have a good night. Hello, everybody. Good night. Good night. And today's fun fact is brought to you by Eli. He wrote his name all by himself. And Audra's letter is A.